I visit film locations to explore storytelling in film. On this occasion, however, I am not visiting the location for the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan, shot on a beach in Ireland, or the or Omaha Beach scene in The Longest Day, shot on an island just off the coast of Brittany, or the beach used in the Big Red One, which took place on the Israeli coast. Instead, I'm on Omaha Beach. This location is relevant because 80 years ago, the US military suffered 2,400 casualties here. This year, a handful of soldiers, the youngest in their late 90s, returned to honor their achievements and their comrades. Their memories will die with them. And the story gets passed from living memory on as history. And I am here on Omaha Beach to explore the portrayal of war and history in film. All film is fantasy. Some are just more authentic. Steven Spielberg, 25 years ago, yep, that film is that old, set out to make a rip-roaring boy's own adventure, loosely based on the saving of the last brother in the Pacific War, but set during the Operation Overlord. In doing research and talking to veterans of the land, and he adjusted his aims and set about telling their story, one of the brutality and the chaos of war, as well as the heroism and at times barbarity. The film is full of inaccuracies. It's a fantasy loosely based on truth, but it resonated with the veterans who praised particularly the opening 20 minute beach scene for its realism. Some inaccuracies are not important, such as the timber obstacles called Ronald's asparagus. Some did point out the sea, while others pointed in land with mines on top to catch landing craft at high tide. The Longest Day, made in 1961, actually gives a better representation of what was faced on June the 6th. Now, completely absent are the massive rows of Belgian gates that were tied together as a steel fence. The bunk of the Rangers' attack was also not accurately represented in the film. Far from being a concrete fortress, the reality is far less imposing. The film appears to have modelled their bunker on naval artillery bunkers, such as this one in Denmark, which was part of the Atlantic Wall. Those found at Nongyes Sumir, 10 kilometres away. The bunker on this cliff was actually a ranging station and fire control. Nongyes Sumir bombarded both Omaha and Gold Beach, and it also targeted Allied naval vessels. One pillbox took a direct hit from the naval bombardment by HMS Ajax, which took out the anti-aircraft gun on the roof of the casement, setting off the ammunition. Two other pillboxes were later taken out by French and US ships. One gun remained active during the, the 6th, but fired less than 100 rounds that day, all of which were inaccurate. The battery was captured the following day, D-Day plus one, after further aerial bombardment and the German defenders surrendering. This is why the Atlantic Wall did not include such an obvious target on Omaha Beach. It would have been bombarded by Allied Navy. Spielberg's bunker is for the audience's benefit, as is the apparent taking of the bunker in 20 minutes, or at least an assault compressed into 20 minutes. In reality, Strong Point Widerstand Nest 73, or WN 73, which was taken by the Rangers, was a rather small pillbox built into the side of the cliff at the western end of the beach. It was protected by the cliff from naval bombardment and it aimed down the beach, protecting the other strong points in an interlocking defence. A network of trenches surrounding these strong points had mortar pits enabling defenders to bombard the beach while staying in cover and protecting machine gunners strafing the beach. There were 15 such positions along the 10 kilometer stretch of Omaha Beach. Along with these positions were several inland positions, such as the Maisie Battery Complex, which rained down fire onto Omaha Beach as well as Utah Beach. It was supposed to be taken out by the Rangers on D-Day, but it would be three days before the guns were silenced. The inland battery of Brecourt Manor further west covered the Utah Beach, and its capture on D-Day was featured in Spielberg's Band of Brothers TV series. 
The reality of D-Day was a lot more complex and time-consuming than portrayed in any movie. The battle lasted hours, well into late afternoon, and Omaha Beach was only fully secured the following day. This reality is worth retelling, I'll bet briefly, to illustrate the choices filmmakers make when recreating historical events. Tom Hanks as Captain Miller of Charlie Company, 2nd Ranger Battalion, is loosely based on fact. The Rangers, as Special Operations Elite Commandos, were primarily tasked with destroying Pont de Hoc artillery battery five kilometres to the west, which threatened shipping and could also bombard both Omaha and Utah beaches. The Rangers were split into three groups. The first was an attack group that climbed the cliff for a direct assault. The second group was in reserve, and the third group, Charlie Company, was tasked to follow the infantry at Omaha, then follow the cliff west, taking out a radar station in between, and reinforcing the rest of the Rangers at Pont de Hoc. The real commander of Charlie Company was 24-year-old Captain Ralph Goranson. His company did not land on Dog Green section of Omaha Beach, as portrayed in the film, but several metres west of Dog Green on Charlie section. U.S. Infantry Regiment landed on Dog Green. Tom Hanks, in his early 40s, made for a great everyman doing his job, but the real hero of the day was a very young man. Does it matter? Well, perhaps, as his youth makes his leadership even more extraordinary. Now, none of the Rangers on D-Day were in U.S. LCVPs, or Higgins boats, but in British Royal Navy LCAs, with Royal Naval crews. The LCA was a British-designed landing craft with four-man crew and capable of carrying 37 troops. Unlike the Higgins, the LCAs had armoured bulkhead sides and a covered deck for the troops. Goranson later praised the Royal Navy crewmen who beat them in the right place at the right time. Now Spielberg set out to make an all-American action movie. Whilst movies are for entertainment and importantly to make money, at the very least break even, this can be overlooked as being unimportant. The problem is that many learn history from film and TV, which can lead to an inaccurate understanding of history. That is, D-Day was an American affair. In reality, 80% of the Navy was the Royal Navy, and the number of Canadian and British troops outnumbered that of the Americans. Of the four beachheads, Omaha was a disaster, and the best laid plans of the Rangers quickly went awry. Of the 68 Rangers on two landing craft, 19 were killed on the beach. More were wounded, leaving only 30 able personnel. With the infantry unable to secure the draw, a small valley leading off the beach, the rangers moved under cover of the cliff further west. They climbed the cliff first using bayonets for footholds, then lowered a rope for the rest to follow, without the special equipment used in taking of Pont de Hoc. The rangers reached the top of the cliff at 7.30, an hour after the first wave of infantry landed on Omaha. Goranson made the decision to support the infantry and take out Strong Point 73 rather than head west to take out the radar station. Only two bunkers survived now, but the defences consisted of barbed wire, trenches, machine gun nests on the cliff top and mortar pits. There was also a fortified barn and house, although by the time the rangers attacked, these had been flattened by naval guns. What followed was slow trench warfare, assault as the rangers cleared ground, only to be forced to defend their gains throughout the morning as defenders made counterattacks. The position just on this cliff top was only secured by 2 p.m. The surviving rangers, led by Goranson, then headed west to attack the radar station, though it had been dis destroyed by naval guns by the time they arrived. They continued to, and they joined up with the rest of the rangers at Pont de Hoc by late afternoon. Unlike Tom Hanks's character, Ralph Goranson fought throughout the war as a ranger and lived to be 93. My visit to Omaha Beach is not about D-Day history. I am neither qualified nor have the time to fully comprehend what went on here 80 years ago.
My interest lies in how we tell stories. Thankfully, most of us will never have to face the horror of war. And it's through cinema that we gain a little understanding of history. Filmmakers obviously prioritise entertainment and being successful. And it's telling that those films which try to get most of it right tend to be more successful. All film is fantasy. This video was shot over several days and I've edited to look like it all fits together, compressing time and distance. Ultimately, it's just pixels lighting up your screen and little numbers creating a facsimile of my speech, natural sounds and music. Saving Private Ryan is a fantasy. It presents an obvious dominating fortress rather than present to the audience the complexity of trench warfare, the confusion and well, the incredulity of how the power of the US military, naval and air and land superiority struggled to take a small pillbox. Film goes, and it includes me, do not enjoy stories that are overcomplicated and confusing. We at least like to know where we're going. Saving Private Ryan was successful not just because of its limited but focused historical accuracy, but also because of its compelling storytelling and emotional depth of its characters, and by focusing on the personal experiences and struggles of the individual soldiers, the film was able to convey the human toll of war in a way that resonated with viewers of all ages and backgrounds. So how do we portray war in media? Do the big epic stories do a better job than the little stories of the individual? Is television better suited for something as epic as D-Day? Uh, are documentaries better than dramatization? Whatever your opinion, over 40,000 stories happen just on Omaha Beach. And over 200,000 stories for Operation Overlord on the Allied side alone. And let's not forget the men and women who are intelligence officers, spies, map makers, and even geographers who tested sand samples. But of course, that's another story.